What is up, you guys? Welcome to yet another edition of Controversial Thoughts, Costa Rica version. One of the amazing things about being able to get into the ocean in the morning and surf for sunrise and then surf at sunset is it gives me a lot of space to relax. And then I come back pretty rejuvenated and I get into some fun research rabbit holes during the day after I've gotten my salt water, my vitamin D, my grounding, and my time in nature. So uh, one of my favorite podcasts that I've heard in the past is Josh Waitzkin and Tim Ferriss. And Josh Waitzkin's quote was, you have to turn it on to turn it off, or you have to turn it off to turn it on is the more accurate translation of that. So I love being here right now in Costa Rica, traveling and turning it off so that I can turn it on and do a bunch of interesting research that hopefully benefits you all. So went down some really fun rabbit holes that I wanna share with you guys today. One of the great fallacies that I see over and over in the health space today is reductionist thinking when it comes to food and nutrients in food or macronutrients in food. Specifically, I'm gonna start by talking about fructose and glucose uh, and ask the question if honey is different than sugar and I'm uh, obviously talking about raw organic honey, and you'll see why in this controversial thoughts. And then I'm going to segue quickly to the question of is all salt created equally with the overarching premise here being that reductionist thinking in nutritional studies or nutritional paradigms doesn't work and fails us. And so we have to be very careful of studies that like to look at isolated fructose, isolated glucose, isolated sodium chloride administration and compare those with studies where actual real unheated honey is used, like our ancestors would have eaten, like the Hadza ate, like I ate with the Hadza in Tanzania a few weeks ago and ask the question, is that honey that's coming out of a tree really bad for me? How do I reconcile that with some studies in mice or rats that say fructose is bad for humans? And then furthermore, what about sea salt? Our ancestors certainly would have gathered this from the ocean. It would have been more than sodium chloride. As you'll see in one of these papers, sea salt is usually about 85% sodium chloride. And then it has about 15% of other minerals, whether it's magnesium, calcium, other things in it, zinc, um, manganese, all sorts of trace minerals in sea salt. Did these make a difference in terms of how we dose sodium with sodium chloride and how many studies actually use sea salt to be part of the intervention. And I don't wanna get, I don't like to be hand wavy here. I wanted to look at actual science because it's easy to say whole food is good. All whole food is good. Processed food, simplified food, reductionist food is bad, which generally ends up being true for humans as we see, but I like to find the science that backs it up. So let's start with this paper on honey, then we'll get to sodium. And I think this is really going to blow your minds. This is some very interesting stuff for me guys. So I came across this paper with honey and it fascinated me. Honey, natural honey lowers plasma glucose, C-reactive protein, homocysteine, and blood lipids in healthy diabetic and hyperlipidemic subjects. They compared it with dextrose and sucrose. Now we have to remember that honey is basically about 50-50 glucose and fructose. Now sucrose is glucose and fructose. So sucrose is gonna be similar to honey in terms of its carbohydrate content than dextrose. Dextrose is a polymer of only glucose, but they made a quote sham honey with a similar amount of sucrose, that is glucose and fructose, and compared it with the honey in a number of things. And as you'll see here, the basic, um, the basic premise, the basic conclusions were that in patients with hypertriglyceridemia, high triglycerides, artificial honey, that is their sham honey, increased triglycerides while honey decreased triglycerides. How cool is that? Completely different things. In patients with hyperlipidemia, artificial honey increased LDL-C while honey decreased LDL-C. The LDL discussion is a whole big common thing that I've talked about in the past. Let's just accept that increasing LDL in the setting of somebody with hyperlipidemia that is diabetic is probably a bad thing because they have metabolic dysfunction. Refer back to my previous discussions on LDL if you want to know about the context of LDL, et cetera. So honey also decreased CRP after 15 days. Now in diabetic patients, honey compared with dextrose, so that's not really apples to apples because dextrose is a glucose. 
Honey is fructose and glucose, and fructose is handled differently by the liver. But nevertheless, honey causes significantly lower rise of plasma glucose. Elevation of plasma glucose was greater after honey than after sucrose at 30 minutes, and was lower after honey than it was after sucrose at 60, 120, and 180 minutes. So something else going on here. All right, honey causes a greater elevation of insulin than sucrose did after 30, 120, and 180 minutes. Honey reduces blood lipids, homocysteine, and CRP in normal and hyperlipidemic subjects. Honey compared with dextrose and sucrose caused a lower elevation in plasma glucose and diabetics. So something is going on here. There are some differences. If you really get into the nuts and bolts of this paper, a lot of it probably has to do with glucose polymers versus fructose and glucose polymers in honey. But the lowering of CRP is fascinating. The differential effects on triglycerides are fascinating and um, some of the changes in insulin. Now, if you guys have followed my stuff, you know that insulin is not the problem. I debate the notion that insulin-induced insulin resistance is the main cause of metabolic dysfunction in humans. I've done a podcast with both Dan Bickman and also talked about this many times with Tommy Wood and others that I really think there's something else going on. I think the major driving factor here is deeper. We're gonna to touch on that a little bit today. It has to do with lipids, it has to do with fatty acids. I believe it has to do with omega-6 fatty acids, specifically excess linoleic acid, or things that accompany that in humans. However, there's something going on here. And I do not think that most humans are metabolically unhealthy because of lots of insulin. And I think that it's okay to spike your insulin from time to time. When I went to Tanzania, a lot of people asked me, weren't you worried about not being in ketosis when you had the honey? The answer is a resounding no. I don't care about being in ketosis necessarily. Occasionally, if I go into ketosis because I'm fasting or there's a hunt that's not successful evolutionarily, that's great. I don't think long-term ketosis is awesome for humans. And I bristle when people in the ketogenic community try and conflate raw organic honey with sucrose, glucose, fructose, like a Coca-Cola. That comparison has been made multiple times. And I think papers like this and the other ones I'm about to show you just demonstrate, show, they demonstrate that there's no comparison here. So interestingly, they say fructose consumption induces insulin resistance, at least in, um, in animal models and probably in some humans when you have pure fructose, hyperinsulinemia, hypertriglyceridemia, and hypertension in animal models. L-arginine, this is an amino acid that is involved in nitric oxide metabolism, is able to prevent fructose-induced hypertension and hyperinsulinemia. How fascinating is that? Honey contains nitric oxide metabolites, and it increases nitric oxide production in various biological fluids. What? You mean honey, a complex real food found in nature, is more than just sucrose? Yes, it is. And this is what I think is fascinating, that we cannot be reductionist in our thinking with regard to foods. We cannot conflate honey with sucrose. Honey is not the same as Coca-Cola, not in human models and not in animal models. So what is going on here? There's, first of all, a connection between nitric oxide metabolism and insulin resistance, which is probably going to have to save, be saved for another controversial thoughts when I get deep into that, but I'm going to touch on a little bit in this one. But L-arginine can rescue that. And if you guys listen to the podcast I did with Joe Rogan, I talked about a study in mice that showed exactly this, that when mice were given honey, it didn't have the same oxidative stress effects, the same inflammatory effects that pure fructose did in those mice. So what's going on? Probably something to do with this nitric oxide, metabolites, and other things in honey. So let's go deeper down this rabbit hole. What is going on here? If honey is a source of nitric oxide metabolites, what do we know about that? And this is where things really get pretty interesting. So there's a number of papers that I found that do confirm that honey has nitric oxide metabolites and honey will increase nitric oxide metabolism. So this is identification of nitric oxide metabolites in various honeys, the effects of intravenous honey. They gave people honey into their vein on plasma and urinary nitric oxide metabolite concentrations. I just wanna point out that the authors of this study show that after heating nitric oxide metabolites decreased in all kinds of honey, this is why you want your honey to be raw and you want your honey to be local and you want it to be as dark as possible. After ultraviolet exposure, nitric oxide metabolites were decreased in four kinds of honey, increased in one kind, who knows, unchanged in two kinds. The darker stored honey had more resistance to heating and ultraviolet light exposure. You want your honey to be fresh, raw, organic, local, higher quality honey, real honey with actual nitric oxide metabolites. So what do they find? Plasma nitric oxide metabolites were increased during one, two, and three hours after infusion by 3%, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21,
17% respectively. No side effects were reported with the use of intravenous honey. Might it be concluded that honey contains various nitric oxide metabolites. Its intravenous infusion increased plasma and urinary nitric oxide metabolites. This study was done in sheep, by the way, not humans. It is also assumed that nitric oxide might be responsible in part for the biological and therapeutic effects of honey. I think that's a reasonable hypothesis and a fascinating conclusion, something we can continue to test. Again, speaking to the notion that honey and real foods found in nature, like fruit, for instance, that may have fructose are not the same as Coca-Cola. Now, do you wanna make all of your diet honey? No. If you're diabetic, do you wanna eat honey? Probably not because you're so metabolically broken, your body's not gonna handle the sugars well. If you are metabolically healthy, are you gonna do best with a little bit of carbohydrates? I believe so. Should you eat those at the exclusion of meat and organs? Absolutely not. You still should make meat and organs the center of your diet. That's been something I've talked about forever. If you wanna do periods of ketosis, great, do that. But don't fear carbohydrates and don't fear fructose in the form of evolutionarily consistent foods. This is what the plant toxicity spectrum is all about. If you guys want to get the plant toxicity spectrum, you can email me, Dr. Paul at heartandsoil.co. You should sign up for my newsletter at heartandsoil.co. I discuss a lot of these articles in the newsletters which come out every week. I drop a lot of science there. If you are not signed up, you are missing out. And while you are at heartandsoil.co, you should check out our new desiccated organ supplements, including Bone Matrix. I did a controversial thoughts last week, that's last week over there, about the importance of calcium on any type of diet and where you can get your calcium. I happen to think microcrystalline hydroxyapatite is the best place to get it. And you can get it from Bone Matrix, bone meal, a very high quality bone meal that would make it hard in soil. And if you need more organs in your diet, get the desiccated organs because they're easy if you don't wanna eat the fresh organs. If you wanna eat the fresh organs, great. Desiccated organs make it a lot easier for a lot of you guys. They're safe for kids. Check us out, heartandsoil.co. Next paper, daily honey consumption on hematological in indices, blood levels of minerals and enzymes. And this one's in humans. Small study, seven men, three women, over, um, they had a controlled diet for two weeks and then they did honey for many weeks after that. And I believe it was 15 weeks. I could be wrong, but um, they did a two week test period. Yeah. So the results showed that honey increased antioxidant agents, increased blood vitamin C by 47%. There's no honey. There's no vitamin C in honey, but it increased the concentration by 47%. That's fascinating. What's going on there? Connection between nitric oxide metabolism, management of antioxidants, and honey, possibly. Beta carotene by 3%, eh, who really cares? Uric acid by 12%, glutathione reductase by 7%. That's an enzyme involved in antioxidant defense. It increased serum iron by 20%, decreased ferritin by 11%, increased the percentage of monocytes by 50%. Increased lymphocyte eosinophil percentages slightly, maybe some immune effects. Reduced serum immunoglobulin E by 34%. Increased serum copper by 33%. Now, there's changes happening with honey. There's something going on. Serum immunoglobulin E is an immunoglobulin involved in the allergy response. It reduced that. That's fascinating. A lot of people think about taking local honey for allergies. Maybe that's what's going on there. So you can see here, it goes on to have all sorts of changes here in the study for these people by taking honey. And I thought that was fascinating too. And I think it's probably connected with, again, many of the things that are found in honey beyond fructose and glucose. We cannot be reductionist here. So if we're thinking about nitric oxide, this is where a lot of things come together for me. And no, hardened soil is not gonna make honey in a pill. You can get honey from your local purveyor, your local beekeeper much better than we could source it or put it in a pill. But I do think for people who want to include carbohydrates in their diet and who are metabolically healthy, it's a good option. I definitely like it. I brought some back from the Maasai. It's very dark and I'm sure it's full of nitric oxide metabolites. But what is the connection between nitric oxide and insulin resistance? Well, that's another rabbit hole for another day, but I wanted to share this other paper with you guys because I thought it was fascinating. So if you look at arginine and citrulline and overall nitric oxide metabolism with endothelial nitric oxide synthase, ENOS, citrulline and arginine are connected and they are all part of a cycle that produces more nitric oxide in conjunction with nitric oxide synthase. So look at this, citrulline and non-essential amino acids prevent fructose-induced non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in rats. Could that happen in humans too? It certainly could. Or is it possible that what we're seeing with some non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in humans is nitric oxide depletion? 
Is it possible that a lot of illnesses are nitric oxide depletion? I think so. Is it possible that some portion of insulin resistance is connected with nitric oxide depletion? Yes, I think it's all connected. So what we know in humans is that many things that increase nitric oxide appear to be beneficial for us. What does that? Stay tuned. I'm going to tell you more in this, later in this one. But giving citrulline, an amino acid found in meat, often not measured because it's non-essential and a rare one, but citrulline found in meat, non-essential amino acid prevents fructose-induced non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in rats, clearly something, at least in the rat model and probably in humans, is connected with nitric oxide synthase and insulin resistance, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. How cool is that? Again, we're back to the nitric oxide story here with regard to insulin resistance. So we're pointing to insulin resistance, nitric oxide, but the overarching discussion is reductionist thinking. There's so much good evidence with honey, again, that I will repeat that in people who are metabolically healthy, I think you're fine to include a local organic raw honey in your diet. There is so much fear mongering out there about sugar and it gets conflated with honey. And I think that is incorrect. So let's go just a little deeper to salt. This is a rabbit hole that I'll probably have to finish on another Controversial Thoughts, but it's a cool one and it's gonna wrap us back around. So check out this study I found. Again, it's pretty similar to the honey study. Natural sea salt confers protection against hypertension and kidney damage in dull salt sensitive rats. What? This is essentially the same model, honey versus sham honey, which is basically sucrose, a mixture of glucose and fructose. Natural sea salt versus sodium chloride there are differences in these rats. So you can see they had four groups of rats control, or five groups of rats control two levels of natural sea salt and refined sea salt, 4%, 8% for both of those. And what they found was that at 15 weeks, this study was 15 weeks, the honey study was two weeks, I apologize. Both the, the sea salt four and sea salt eight groups had significantly lower systolic and diastolic blood pressures compared to refined salt four and eight rats. Now, RS8 rats, refined salt, 8% rats, markedly higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure compared to all groups. Echocardiography sacrif before sacrifice showed abnormalities. That's in the way the heart is moving. In refined salt 4, sea, uh, sea salt 8, and refined salt 8 hearts. So at the highest sea salt, there were some changes, but at the sea salt 4, there were no changes, while control and sea salt 4 displayed normal measurements. Now you can go on, you can look at all this renin-aldosterone system. We don't have to get into that today. It kind of makes sense what happened, but you can see in this paper, it's pretty interesting. They'll show the way that systolic and blood pressure change for these rats. Again, the sea salt four stayed the lowest. This is the control. This is systolic and diastolic. It didn't bump up a little bit at the end, but it's hard to know what this level is correlated with humans. Echocardiography changes. Here's systolic blood pressures in a bar graph. You can look at these echocardiography metrics, left ventricular mass, et cetera. Again, as they say, the sea salt four had no changes, whereas the refined salt four, the refined salt eight, and the sea salt eight did show changes. If you look at the histology of the kidney, it looked much better for the sea salt. I'm not a histologist. I'll take their word for the numerous eosinophilic homogeneous hyaline droplets, et cetera. But you can see here, they say that Sea salt four and sea salt eight only had scant eosinophilic homogeneous hyaline droplets uh, observed in the cytoplasm of the proximal convoluted epithelial cells. This is a long way back to medical school. I'm not going to go into this, but you can see basically that histopathological changes were different in the sea salt groups versus the refined salt groups. Here's the percentage of glomerulosclerosis. You can see the control. Sea salt four, sea salt eight, much lower in the sea salts than the refined salt. Again, we cannot be reductionistic here. Is sea salt the same as sodium chloride, pure sodium chloride? Doesn't look like it, at least not in rats. So when your doctor tells you to reduce salt, is he telling you to reduce sea salt or regular salt? Should we be eating foods that are not the evolutionary foods that we have experienced? This is a fascinating concept to me. My answer is no. We should not be eating foods that are massively changed from their evolutionary history. This is the reason I went to Tanzania to see the Hadza. I think it's totally reasonable to eat honey out of a tree or the best thing you can get, which is honey out of a hive that's not heated, that's organic, that's raw. I think it's totally reasonable to consume a moderate amount of sodium, I should say sea salt with minerals, whether that's from Redmond, I like Maldon salt. There's all kinds of good salts out there right now. That will probably not be the same as a refined salt. But on the flip side, 
you probably shouldn't be consuming regular sodium chloride. So when you look here, they say on the weight basis, sea salt contained 85.7% sodium chloride, whereas refined salt, 99.9% .9 sodium chloride. In addition to sodium, sea salt contained calcium, potassium, magnesium, trace amounts of iron, manganese, and zinc. Interesting. Now, if you go down this rabbit hole, they say, they talk about magnesium. And I found this particularly interesting. The fact that magnesium can lead to a reduction in blood pressure by acting as a natural calcium channel blocker, increasing nitric oxide and improving endothelial dysfunction. Hmm, what's going on there? Let me just make a comment here. People always ask, where can you get magnesium on a carnivore diet? Where can you get magnesium on an animal-based diet? To which I reply, meat is actually a very good source of magnesium, having over 100 milligrams in one pound of beef. Now, some of you might eat two pounds of beef, some of you might only eat one pound of beef, but with magnesium, you have to remember, it's also about how much you retain. I talked about this on the Controversial Thoughts, or my AMA, Ask Me Anything podcast last week, because if you get a bunch of magnesium from plants, which are claimed to be the, the magnesium source, and I debate this, you're not going to absorb it. In fact, if you go to Healthline, for instance, a website that I'm not a fan of because they're clearly leaning toward plants and they're clearly talking about the plant uh, Illuminati. Magnesium rich foods that are super healthy, dark chocolate, mm, it's got some magnesium. You're not gonna absorb much of it because of all the oxalates and other phytic acid. And I talked about this in my book, The Carnivore Code. This has been done with other divalent cations like zinc. If you eat them with mm, oxalates and phytic acid, you are not absorbing them. Oh, let's see, avocados. Maybe you'll get some magnesium from avocados. Nuts, nope, not getting much from nuts. Tons of phytic acid and lots of oxalates. Again, lots of chelators, legumes, same story. You're failing here, Healthline tofu. Hmm, what's the highest food in phytic acid? Soybeans, hmm, not gonna absorb much there. Seeds, full of oxalates and phytic acid. Whole grains, full of oxalates and phytic acid. Uh, some types of fatty fish, actually we're into the animal kingdom here, thankfully. But because Healthline is so bought in to the pescatarian plant-based narrative, they never will tell you that meat is actually a great source of magnesium. Lo and behold, nutrition data, fatself.com, beef, ground beef, 90% lean. Look at this, 100 grams has 23 milligrams of magnesium. There's 454 grams in a pound. So you have to multiply that by 4.5. And what do you get? Over 100 milligrams of highly absorbable magnesium in a pound of ground beef, along with all kinds of other important things like citrulline that we talked about earlier, L-arginine to make nitric oxide, taurine, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Well, imagine that. What kind of a crazy world would it be if some of these websites actually admitted that meat was the real health food and organs? So let's talk about magnesium real quickly and its effect on nitric oxide, because this is really fascinating. And then I'm gonna wrap this one up. So I went down this rabbit hole and I'm thinking, why is magnesium increasing nitric oxide? And the most cogent hypothesis I can find online is that the delta-60 saturase involved in essential fatty acid conversions is magnesium dependent. So if you don't have enough magnesium, that is if you are metabolically unhealthy, refer back to the conversations I've had with James Antonio and others talking about magnesium depletion. It's not that you're not getting enough magnesium. Generally speaking, it's because you're wasting magnesium because you are metabolically unhealthy. That is the reason for metabolic, that is the reason for magnesium deficiency that is rampant in our population. People, doesn't matter if you supplement a ton of magnesium if you remain metabolically unhealthy because you will waste it. So you can see, let's go down this rabbit hole. Delta 60 saturates as the target of beneficial actions of magnesium. Well, that's interesting. Now, just in case you guys don't remember this, the omega-6 and omega-3 pathways look like this. They are parallel, delta-60 saturase, elongase, delta-5 desaturase, elongase. The omega-6 pathway goes ALA to EPA and DHA. The omega, that's the omega-3 pathway, excuse me. The omega-6 pathway, linoleic acid, our old friend, goes to GLA, DGLA, arachidonic acid, and adrenic acid. So what if you have an incompatibility or an in uh, an inefficiency in your conversion or maintenance or synthesis of delta-60 saturase. You aren't going to be able to do either of these things. You certainly aren't going to make enough essential fatty acids, which include arachidonic acid, EPA and DHA. Now, there's plenty of all of these in animal fat, guys. That's the topic of a different Controversial Thoughts video. So let's just say that. You don't need to supplement with linoleic acid. You don't need to supplement with GLA or DGLA 
You'll make plenty of arachidonic acid. You'll make plenty of EPA and DHA with just eating fat from animals like fire starter, tallow, suet. Fire starter is a supplement from hardened soil. It's an easy to take high stearic acid tallow. All of that will be just fine, but what if you don't make enough delta-60 saturates, you're not gonna make these EFAs, these essential fatty acids, and you're gonna run into problems. So here's an interesting hypothesis paper. A defect in the activity of delta-6 and delta-5 desaturases may be a factor in the initiation and progression of atherosclerosis. Huh, I found it interesting that this author suggested that a defect in the activity of D6 and D5 decreases the formation of GLA, DGLA, arachidonic acid, we talked about that, EPA, DHA, and ALA from linoleic acid. This in turn leads to inadequate formation of prostaglandins, prostacyclin, like poxins, resolvins, neuroprotectins, nitric oxide, nitrolipids that have anti-inflammatory and antiplatelet effects. Hmm, okay, so that may be what's going on. How fascinating is that? Beneficial effects of oral magnesium supplementation on insulin sensitivity and serum lipid profile. Yep. Oral mag improved insulin sensitivity and lipid profile in mildly hypertensive patients. These potential beneficial effects of magnesium on associated metabolic factors could be helpful for patients with hypertension in terms of overall cardiovascular risk reduction. So they're kind of going against what I said earlier. They're supplementing people with metabolic dysfunction with magnesium. It still could be a benefit. I would say fix the metabolic dysfunction for these people and you will maintain your magnesium levels, your delta-60 saturates will work, you'll have EFAs, you will have prostacyclins, prostaglandins, nitric oxide, we're back to nitric oxide, your endothelium will be healthy, all of these. Last one here, effect of magnesium deficiency on delta-60 saturase activity and fatty acid composition of rat liver microsomes. They found the same thing. The decrease of delta-60 saturate activity was attributed to a lower concentration of actual enzyme molecules as the result of decreased rate of protein synthesis and magnesium deficiency in these rats. So what am I saying here? Let's bring it back home in case I've lost you guys. Don't be reductionist in your thinking. Honey with nitric oxide intermediates, nitric oxide producing compounds appears to be good for our endothelium. Triglycerides go in different directions versus sucrose. And we know that endothelial dysfunction is a major player in atherosclerosis. Honey is probably good for you. It's not the fact that it has fructose that's bad. It's the fact that the fructose and the sucrose have been stripped away from the things we've always seen evolutionarily with them that probably makes it a problem. Don't fall prey to reductionist fear-mongering thinking in ketogenic communities. Furthermore, with salt, the context, the content, the, the content of minerals like magnesium is probably affecting nitric oxide synthesis as well and probably leads to differential effects in sea salt consumption versus processed salt consumption. Your body needs magnesium. Where do you get it? Get it from meat, get it from organs and don't lose it because you need to be metabolically healthy. If you want to supplement, fine, but know that too much magnesium can imbalance calcium and you can go down that road. I prefer you guys get it from food. Think about meat as just as much magnesium as many other plants and you're going to maintain, you're going to retain so much more of it. So what's going on here? We're seeing real foods found in nature all kind of coming back to nitric oxide production, all these things and that leading to insulin sensitivity. How fascinating is that? And I wanna point out that magnesium supplementation appears to be better when you give taurine. Oh, that's interesting. Healthline won't tell you that because then they'd have to tell you that taurine is found in meat and only in meat. It's one of these special animal-based nutrients. The potential protective effects of taurine on heart disease. If you read many of these papers, especially some of the ones I talked about earlier, um, you will find this one specifically, which I will show you. They will show you that um, taurine potentiates the effects of magnesium. Isn't that interesting? That an animal food like a meat or an organ like liver, like you're gonna get fresh or with our desiccated supplements from hardened soil is gonna have both magnesium and this unique amino acid only found in animal foods that potentiates its effect. Nobody ever talks about taurine and magnesium together, but you should think about that because Healthline isn't gonna tell you that chocolate doesn't have a lot of taurine, that avocados don't have a lot of taurine, that soybeans don't have a lot of taurine. And again, we're back to an evolutionarily consistent diet. What were our ancestors eating? I believe this is a very good metric, a very good litmus for things we might be doing as humans. And we see this repeatedly over and over in literature when we use the right lens. Again. If we don't look for something, we won't find it. But I found this to be very fascinating 
and very interesting connections. One last paper, and then I will wrap it up. Delta-60 saturates gene polymorphism associated with lipoprotein oxidation in vitro. Again, more evidence that perhaps if you don't make essential fatty acids for whatever reason, whether you have a polymorphism in your Delta-60 saturase or you're magnesium deficient because you have metabolic dysfunction or you don't get enough magnesium because you're eating processed salt and you're metabolically unhealthy and you're never eating meat and you're just trying to get your magnesium from vegetables that actually don't give you much magnesium and they don't give you any taurine and you're not making enough essential fatty acids and you're not making enough prostacyclins, prostaglandins, nitric oxide, resolvins, lipoxins, that could be problematic for you as a human. <laughs> so the takeaway here is that reductionist thinking will kill us in nutritional medicine. We have to think, we have to look for studies where they actually use real food. Don't fear fructose from fruit. Don't eat it at the exclusion of the most nutrient dense foods, meat and organs, whether they're fresh or desiccated. But so many people feel better when they include some carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates like fructose, glucose, or sucrose found in honey or fruit are not going to kill you. They're just not because they occur with all of these little micronutrients that allow our bodies to function optimally, that lead to optimal levels of nitric oxide synthesis, which leads to improved endothelial function. And that we know is the key to nearly everything. Certainly it's the key to sexual arousal, erections, men and women, and atherosclerotic progression. If you listen to the podcast I did with Malcolm Kendrick, we talked about this paper which shows that probably the pleiotropic effect of statins has to do with nitric oxide. So maybe it's not even LDL reduction with statins that are causing their benefits, but certainly statins have tons of side effects, but this is probably the reason that they show some benefit in people with cardiovascular disease. Do you need statins? No, this is exactly the same or very similar. This is analogous to what I would say with plant molecules. Are you going to take a statin to get your nitric oxide? Well, you could, it works. Are you gonna use sulforaphane to get your glutathione? You could, it works. But both of these have side effects. Listen to the AMA last week where I talked about this with Rhonda Patrick's criticism of the sulforaphane stuff that I was talking about on Joe Rogan's podcast. Don't use a statin to get nitric oxide. Eat real foods, give yourself the nutrients that your body uses to make nitric oxide, arginine, citrulline, magnesium, taurine. They're all found in animal foods. You don't need a statin and those don't have side effects. Get it guys, get it? I hope you're getting it. Don't take sulforaphane for glutathione. Don't use a statin for nitric oxide. Eat like your ancestors have. That is the reason I went to Tanzania. These guys are amazing. Look for part two of the podcast with Anthony Gustin coming on Tuesday. We're gonna talk about all about Tanzania, but the take home here, don't be reductionist in your nutritional thinking. Honey is not the same as sugar. Salt is not all created equally. And if you want to thrive, eat like your ancestors. And that was why I went to Tanzania to see how your ancestors are eating because the Hadza, I believe, are the best time machine we're gonna have. They think about hunting all the time. Meat and organs are the center of their diet. They eat honey when they can find it. They eat seasonal fruit. And unfortunately, they've been corrupted by many things like more Ugali, cigarettes, and marijuana. But generally, they are very healthy and the majority of their diet is based on the foods that I think make us healthy. This is what the animal-based diet is all about what we do at Hardened Soil. This is what it's all about. Email me, drpaul at hardensoil.co if you have questions. To your health, stay radical, stay non-dogmatic, stay open-minded, results over dogma. I can't wait to have some more keto folks in my podcast. We'll do a little friendly debate. Love you all. Catch you soon.